at the age where you're expecting kids to say mom or dad, he would just be making sound. The child's brain. Bravo. And the miracle of language. No, it's me, Rachel. How does a child learn to talk? How about this one? And to read? <laughs> what happens if something goes wrong? I have this, um, this thing in my brain that's called dyslexia. The brain's dynamic first years. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease, and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb, as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, or heft them pound for pound, and they will differ, if they do, a syllable from sound. A child's brain. whirling profusion of billions and billions of neurons, reaching out to billions more neurons to form trillions of connections, pulsing with electric and chemical energy. Exuberant connectivity. The cells literally are going wild making all these connections, discovering each other, forming the basis of what we call something learned. Learning is about connection and connectivity and exuberance. You start with a block of marble, like a sculpture would. And there's a lot of marble there. A young child has hundreds of trillions of connections in the brain, twice as many connections as the adult. And then comes along the sculptor who takes away bits of the marble to reveal a form. Experience is the sculptor. Experience determines which of those connections to take away and which to leave. That's what learning is. It's changing the weights of the connections in the brain depending on experience. The child's brain is plastic, a magnificent, flexible engine for learning. A child learns to crawl, then walk, run, and explore. A child learns to reason, to pay attention, and remember. A child learns to make friends. But nowhere is learning more dramatic than in the way a child learns to master language. The great leap that the brain makes that is nothing short of a miracle. So has she started talking yet? She talks, but we don't understand her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she says words, but there, there is no meaning. Okay. She probably has about um, five words that we can clearly understand. 
Uh, she says Kitty. She says Elmo. She says Daddy. Uh, she says Get. She says Woof for Doggy. Does she have any other words, Nate? I think Nate. Oh, that's right. She says Day for Nate. Because that's him. That's the big guy over here. <laughs> Look at this. Telephone. Hello? Who's there? <laughs> oh, I got a queen. A queen? <laughs> Let me see. Language development represents one of these profound, mysterious changes. You're welcome, honey. Thanks. <laughs> You bring a baby home from the hospital, a wrinkly newborn at seven pounds, and within three years, that child can talk in sentences and speak to anyone and deceive you with their words and inspire you with their words. And so it's, how does this come about? Wow. Miss me. Like, wait, stay there. I want to do that, too. No, I got to do it with bananas, okay? Oh, yeah, I want to give bananas, too. That, that would be funny. No one nana. I know that's what I'm really trying to do. There Nearly go. all children learn to speak as easily as a bird learns to sing. No, I'm oh yeah, that's right. I want a whole wall of this what? Michael Blankenship and is an exception. He kid that you my cart. At five years old, by the time most children have mastered okay, grammar, Michael still struggles to make oh. himself understood, and no one yet understands why. Did that guy Did you hear that? Yeah, that guy just see me. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When Michael was at the age where you're expecting kids to say mom or dad or um, some type of a noise, he did not offer to make any type of a sound. Didn't even try. All the other nieces and nephews were, and we were noticing that uh, Michael wasn't. Get her, get her, get her, get her. I think Michael was probably close to. Two and a half to three years old before he started saying the normal words that most kids start with. What fun? And even at that point, when he would try to say mom or dad, it was ma and da. He still couldn't say the whole word. Oh, peach. Oh, like a peach. I don't like peachy. Michael, it's peach. Peach. Oh, wow, this wash. Nice try. Ow! He didn't have much of vocabulary until I would say he was probably three and a half years old. Yeah. And then he so. started picking up on different words. And we knew what he meant because he lived with us. But anybody else, our family, I did not know what he was saying. What does it look like? Hmm? Do I look really big or really small? Uh -huh. Small? <laughs> Michael's difficulties with words have nothing to do with his intelligence. Good, okay, if you turn him around, see what happens. In her laboratory at the University of Oregon, neuroscientist Helen Neville is trying to understand what has gone wrong. Oh, it's ball. Yeah, I like that one a lot, too. I like to sandwiches eat for lunch. While Michael is distracted by a puppet show, Electrodes in the bonnet he wears pick up electrical pulses generated by his brain as he listens to sentences laced with grammatical errors. Big kids like to Coke drink from a can. We're eavesdropping on communication and at the language system of the brain itself. Make cookies with chocolate chips. Neville is studying the connections between speaking, listening, and understanding, closely linked parts of the brain's complex language system. It's very important to take a language-impaired child and evaluate what's deficient and what isn't. The back yard. Language depends on so many different systems and structures in the brain that a problem within any one of those systems could lead to a final common problem. That is a, a language impairment. Great! All of them down. Let's take a look at what we've got. Jumped. Jumped? Oh, wait. Well, I want to hear jumped. 
Perfect, perfect. While scientists are still searching to understand why the brain sometimes fails to process language successfully, crawled. With practice, children like Michael can improve. Crawled. Yes. And what does this one say? Michael still has difficulty producing sounds accurately. Wick. Licked. Wick. That's close. For example, the L sound. He doesn't have the L sound. Um, he will work later on sounds like the R's and the V sounds and the TH sounds. Um, he's, he's improved dramatically. So many of the early developing sounds that he didn't have when he was initially seen are now there. Nut. Nut. Very good. That's it. H. H. Make sure you put that T on. Pizza. It's got teeth. It's hot. 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 Okay. Through and repetition and practice, Michael is becoming fluent in the spoken language that is his birthright as a human being. Rat. Oh, and Rat. Got that. Okay. He is John shaping Michael. his own brain, open. changing it with every syllable and sound. With the kitty open. Gate. Gate. Good job. He's excited to expand his vocabulary and to learn how to say words. When you pet a dog, pat. At the dog, very good. <laughs> Sometimes you can't shut him up, but uh, it's he's he's coming along. He every every week there's a difference in his speech. It's getting better and better. The human brain is highly adaptable, and the young human brain shows even a greater ability to change than older brains. By studying Michael and others like him, we're getting a very basic understanding of how a system of neurons in the brain could give rise to human language. This marvelous skill, which is without limits. Without limits, we can generate new sentences that you've never heard before, uh, ad infinitum, and you can understand them, even though you've never heard them before. So how is that possible? She, she, there are thousands of human languages, and babies are born with the capacity to learn any of them. They begin by listening. A baby sorts through a babble of sounds with more keen an ear than a conductor rehearsing a symphony orchestra. At the University of Washington, neuroscientist Pat Cool has been studying the building blocks of language, the vowels and consonants that make up words. In this particular experiment, we're looking at how children respond to the sounds of their native language and the sounds of a foreign language. We're recording what's happening to the brain as the baby's listening to the Chinese Mandarin Xi. And then what happens to the brain when that sound is changed to this Chinese Mandarin chi sound? Now, of course, to us, they sound like she, she. They sound like the same thing. But we're interested in whether or not the baby's brain records a change when a physical change in the sounds is uh, made. As Americans, we cannot hear the distinction. It really sounds like the same category, SH. To the Chinese, they say, no, no, there's a very clear shift. And the interesting thing that the studies have demonstrated is that at birth and for a short period thereafter, babies have this incredibly exquisite ability to hear differences between all the sounds used in the world's languages. The babies are outperforming us. I like to refer to them as citizens of the world in the beginning. And of course, we are not citizens of the world. We're quite culture-bound listeners. At seven months, babies are still citizens of the world. But by the time they reach 11 months, they are citizens of a single country, specialists in one language. By 11 months, the babies are behaving like their parents. This baby is not responding 
to the change between she and to chi. It's now she, she to the baby, just like it is for us as adults. The news is that by 11 months, we are not perceiving reality. We're not responding to the real differences that exist in the sounds. We're listening through this filter that was developed early in life as we mapped the sounds of our language uh, during listening. The baby starts out with a keen ability to hear distinctions. Ready? Can we do it again? The feat of development is to actually form categories and ignore some of those distinctions. Here goes the train. The ones that are great for a foreign language, but not for the language you're trying to master. Three. I did it. Three. And that ability has produced a brain that's a very, very different one than we saw just uh, four months earlier. As a child grows into an adult, the brain becomes more and more complex, an intricate modular organ of many highly specialized parts. In nearly all adults, language finds its home in the left cerebral hemisphere. Vocabulary, grammar, comprehension are different language systems with their own neural circuitry. We have very little understanding about how this highly differentiated mosaic comes about. How did it get to be that way? That's what we want to know. Is it there at birth? Does it develop over time? What's driving the development? Is it based in our genes? Or does it depend on experience? What we're going to be doing today is measuring the, the brain's response to words that she understands from the list that you filled out. Mm -hmm. And we'll re be recording over the different areas of the brain, so we'll see where there's more activity and where that happens in the brain. How specialized is a baby's brain? What part of the brain does a baby use to understand words? Pint. Unit. Dog. In a series of experiments at the yeah. University of California, San Diego, Shoot. developmental psychologist Debbie Mills baby. has found that 13-month-old babies Bones. listen and understand with both cerebral hemispheres. Banana. Ball. Duck. What? But by 20 months, at a time when babies have been learning as many as a dozen words a day, increasing the size of their vocabulary dramatically, Shoot. The language center of the brain has begun to shift to the left hemisphere. Milk. ¿Dónde están los pies? Muy bien. ¿Dónde está la mano? Muy bien. What is driving this specialization of language? Is it an inevitable biological process? A product of the child's maturing brain? ¿Dónde está el agua? Muy bien. Or is it a result of a child's increasing experience with words? Where's the diaper? Good job. Children who understand more than one language are helping scientists answer these questions. Muy bien. ¿Dónde está la leche? Ariel Elgase is almost two. <laughs> <laughs> because her parents speak English and Spanish, she understands both languages. ¿Dónde está el gato? Muy bien. But she knows more Spanish words than English ones, which makes Ariel a perfect subject for Mills's experiment. Baby. Jugo. Bubbles. If age alone is driving brain specialization, then by two, both English and Spanish should have begun to shift into Ariel's left hemisphere. Plantel. But if increasing vocabulary size is driving specialization, then Ariel's left hemisphere will respond to Spanish words, while English will provoke a response everywhere in her brain. Borde. Compute. Agua. In fact, Mills and her research team have found that in children like Ariel, the brain has begun to specialize in response to Spanish, the language they know best. Cookie. English words provoke a more diffuse response all across the brain. Shoes. 
That really suggests that it is experience with language that's driving these specializations. It can't be maturation because it's in the same child and in the same brain. A startling, astonishing revelation that has occurred over the past few years is that experience is a major player in driving the development and differentiation of the brain. If language takes its place in the left hemisphere, what happens when the left hemisphere is compromised by injury or disease? For most of her life, eight-year-old Katie Warwick has suffered seizures so devastating that today she can no longer even talk. After agonizing discussions with doctors at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, her parents have made up their minds. Katie's doctors have advised them that their little girl has just one hope of living like other children. Strike at the seizures by eliminating the place in the brain where they are found, the left hemisphere. Katie is going to have nearly half her brain surgically removed. So when they tell you that, all you hear is the risk. Four years ago, we said, I'm sorry, but we're not even going to consider that. That's not even an option for us. We're going to exhaust all of our possibilities with drugs before we can even think about that. Well, four years later, we did. <laughs> there is no more drugs out there for her. She's been on them all. The operation will take six hours. If it succeeds, her seizures will stop, and Katie might even learn to talk again. I just have to keep telling myself, the outcome's gonna be worth it. The outcome's gonna be worth it. It was seven years ago that 14-year-old Michael Rabine had the left part of his brain removed. Every two years, he joins other children like him for a reunion. They are a small band, children who have struggled back from an operation that has cured their seizures, but robbed them of part of their brain, leaving them with half their body paralyzed. He had learned to walk again, learned how to talk again. You know, it, was... it was just like being an infant again, too. He had to start from scratch. He knew his ABCs and he could count backwards from 10. He had to learn all that all over again. So it was pretty hard. It was an uphill battle. <laughs> it still is today. Yeah. There's things today that he has to learn every day of his life. You doing okay? Yeah. yeah, you look great. All right, I'll tell you what we're gonna start with doing. I'm gonna say two words. I want you to listen to them really closely and tell me whether they're the same word or whether they're different words. Are you ready? Pat, bat, Different. fit, feet. Different. At Johns Hopkins Hospital, Bug. neuroscientist Dana Boatman has been testing Michael Pat, Rabine ever bat. since his left hemisphere was removed. Part of her study of how children learn to understand spoken yeah. language. Same. One of the surprising findings of our study is that when we test Michael's abilities to understand speech independent of his ability to speak, he performs within normal limits for his age. Tick. Different. 
the right hemisphere seems to do every bit as good a job at understanding spoken speech as the left hemisphere. And it suggests to us that those abilities are not just in the left hemisphere, but that they're represented in both hemispheres of the brain. Ready to wear some headphones? Are you going to stay awake for this? I thought you got a nap today. I did. Oh, so you need another one? <laughs> It seems that there is much more plasticity there than we had originally anticipated. How do you account for the fact that you can do all these things? Try your best. Persistence. Persistence is the key. Determination. <laughs> you do seem like a really hard worker. I watched you doing those tests. Are those tough? A little bit. Some are easy, some hard. What's the hard part? Is it remember, remembering it? No, speak. Speech is the diff most difficult thing for a left hemisphere patient to overcome because you lose your speech center on that side. Memory's good. You can remember anything. I love math. <laughs> But speaking. Hard. A little bit. Every Saturday all through the summer, Michael races mini stock cars at the Tri-County Speedway near his home in upstate New York. <laughs> More than once. How many times did you go over? Twice. My got scared to half death. <laughs> I closed my eyes. <laughs> you must close your eyes too. Oh, my heart was in my throat. We saw you holding your own, and then we saw the car break down. What happened? That spark plug broke the spark plug. That then, was all it was. And Danny didn't <laughs> have one in his pocket. How'd that feel? Well, oh, sad. You hate it when the little things let you down, don't you, Bob? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You were at Tasty Freeze one night, remember? Mm-hmm. And you looked around, couldn't find Mike. He was up on the pole. <laughs> and then the seizures hit. When local doctors could not tell the Rabines what was wrong, they took Michael to Johns Hopkins Hospital. I think that they knew what it was before we ever got there, yeah, just so from the descriptions just by from. At him. And then they just kind of dropped it on us. They took a lot of decision, a lot of soul searching to do it. Yeah. When it, on a day when he had a good day, when he might have 50 or 60 or 70 seizures. You, you kind of had to sit there and go, do we really want to do this to him? You know, is it something that's going to benefit him? Then the next day was And then the next day he may have three, four hundred seizures, and it was like, no, there's no doubt in your mind today. Finally, you know, it got to the point where it got so bad that we, we had, had to, to do, do something. something. And then the day we sent him into surgery, he didn't have any seizures that day.
I began testing Michael as early as the first week after he had surgery. And despite the fact that he was largely mute at that time, he was showing an intact ability to, to hear and to process spoken speech. That suggests to us that these children may have the abilities already in place in the right hemisphere to acquire language and that they can then build on those abilities and develop language. By six months after surgery, Michael's speech understanding abilities were back to what they were before surgery. At that point, he was producing one, two-word utterances spontaneously. Very slowly, the ability to produce words comes back over the course of a couple of years. The extent to which they're able to produce fluent speech seems to vary from child to child. I got Michael in my class about, I think it was seven months after the operation, and he was not using full sentences. He was always speaking in two or three word phrases and doing lots of gesturing. We worked hard trying to get Michael to increase his vocabulary to speak sentences. I remember the first full sentence that he, that he told me, that he gave us. He said um, to me, I love you with all my heart. Michael? Yeah. <laughs> Are you awake? Yeah. Are you going to be taking a nap in there? No. <laughs> By scanning the brains of children like Michael, who have lost their left hemispheres, Dana Boatman is trying to learn how the brain's language systems have been reorganized. Are you ready to start working? Yeah. You're going to hear those sounds now. I want you to decide if they're the same or different. If they're the same, you're going to press the button. Do you remember that part? Yeah. We know that the right hemisphere is supporting language recovery. We're now starting to try and identify the exact areas in the right hemisphere that are being recruited. Is it the same area that the child used in the left hemisphere? Or is it a different area? Do they need more of the right hemisphere to support language than they may have needed previously in the left hemisphere? Boatman's preliminary findings show that areas in the right hemisphere that take on the job of understanding language correspond to the language areas in the left hemisphere. But the right hemisphere is not as efficient as the left. Michael needs more of his right hemisphere to understand the spoken word than a child with both hemispheres. We have children as old now as 16 years of age who have had left hemispherectomies who are able to recover the ability to understand spoken speech every bit as well as they did before surgery and as do normal children. So this suggests that we need to revise our notion of uh, an age limit on when these surgeries can be done and take into consideration the fact that different language functions may be affected differently by age. All right, there you are. That's the shot. Right in there. He's still the same boy inside that he was before the surgery. Right there. He didn't lose his drive or his determination. He'll just keep trying and trying and trying. Get it? Get it. No. I was going to say James Dillon. We've learned to rely on each other a great deal. We're a very close family, aren't we, bud? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In a way, this kind of stole some of his childhood. Yes. And it stole it from us, too. Yeah. Because, you know, the years that when he's in first, second grade, those are pretty precious. I mean, they're still precious the years that we had, but they were pretty frustrating, too. <laughs> you know. But we couldn't ask for a nicer boy now. Mm. Ha, ha, ha.
There's the laugh. <laughs> In the plasticity of the child's brain, there is continual reason for hope. You want more push? Six months after her left hemisphere was removed, Katie Warwick is no longer suffering relentless firestorms in her brain. While the years of seizures have left their mark, Katie's right hemisphere is adapting to its new responsibilities. It's just a joy to hear her excited about some. She wakes up happy. She's really in tune to what's going on around her. She's a whole lot more aware. Hey, you gotta reach it. It's, it's like an awakening. I, I told Robert it's like having a different child. We have to learn to get to know her all over again. <laughs> Katie's language is beginning to come back. Her understanding has improved. And she is showing signs of talking. Uh oh. Oh, you don't want that ball. You want this ball. There's sounds and noises starting to come out of her in her own little way in her own little language, just like a baby does, you know, how they, when they first start to say words, they're not very clear, but you kind of get the message of what they want. Eyes, ears, nose. Every couple of weeks or something, we'll see something different. Eyes. <laughs> Feel like you're so close, you know, it's just like tomorrow yeah, she's gonna yeah, come yeah. up and Say, hi, Mom and Dad, what's for breakfast? You know, it's just that close. You can just see her, see her forming the words and trying to get them out. But I imagine it's a little tougher, you know, with the damage and stuff. So, but we're looking forward to it. Yeah. There was once a prince who wanted to marry a princess. But she had to be a real princess. The prince looked and looked, and he met many princesses. But the prince sent all of them away. One day, there was a big storm. For most of us, speaking is as natural and inevitable as walking. Come in, said the king. Come in, said the queen. Reading is a high-wire balancing act, a performance by the brain that demands a sophisticated coordination of many of its parts. Reading never just happens. Reading is an example of one of the most complex, everyday human cognitive performances we have. And she went off to make the bed. If we're novice or young, it happens in a certain way in the brain. If we're older, automatic processes are being used in other parts of the brain. If we're, st we're reading Chinese characters, one aspect of our brain is being used. If we're reading an alphabet, another aspect of our brain is being used. Once long ago, in a dark, lonely place, where the light of the sun was never to be seen, there lived an elfin creature with hollow cheeks and waxen complexion. Across the valley in a place where the sun played on every leaf and flower lived a maiden with cheeks like rose petals and hair like golden silk. Well, think syntax, think vocabulary, think words that you never ever hear in oral discourse around the table. The child has to learn to put all these hundreds of concepts together to read. Tab is a cat. Tab has a cow. Tab is Mac. For some children, reading comes easily. Mac is a bad cow. Pat has the ham. Pet. Pet. Hit. Pet. Add the pen. For others, it is a struggle that has nothing to do with their powers to think or reason. Pet. The ham. Nice job. Want to try it one more time? 
in order to be able to read, we have to understand what the correspondence is between the sounds that make up words and the visual information that we provide in letters. And so what happens is, for example, compared to language, which children acquire quite naturally, uh, reading has to be explicitly taught. All right, are you ready? Quick as you can. How about this one? Oh, my, you've got it. Reading is many different kinds of behaviors. It's letter naming. It's letter perception. So we got to make sure we know which letter it is. The stick is first. Ship. Slip. It's word perception. Stick. Spin. It's recognizing words. Okay. It's comprehension. Okay. Tap, hit, tap. And all those behaviors will utilize different parts of the brain. Whether we're talking about a single letter or whether we're talking about reading a passage of Proust. The pen is hot. Put the to read. The brain must cobble together a variety of parts that evolved for other purposes. Vision, hearing, judgment, memory, all come into play in a rapid-fire overlapping process that scientists are only just beginning to understand. We are looking at a, a very um, unusual skill that we have learned. And the question is, when we learn a skill like that, where do we place it in the brain? What part of the brain becomes available to do this very specific skill? For a child just learning to read, even a single letter will set off a complex series of reactions. The brain begins by focusing its attention on the reading task itself. Then it captures a visual representation of the letter and sends it to the areas of the brain where the visual symbol gets hooked up to the letter's sound and meaning. Trap. Finally, the letter is articulated. It's incredible. We've got about 17 different regions that are all involved in reading. One of them can easily go awry. So why don't we start right here. What's this word? Shoulder island. Island. Correctly. Scientific. Banquet, mm, doubtful, is it okay if I skip that word? Do you want, can you give it a try? Okay. Just give it your best Nonsense. shot. Nonsense, Miss Chance. All right. Here we go, buddy. How about these? I have this, um... This thing in my brain that's called dyslexia. I don't know the first one. Hesitating. It means something. I don't know how big in my brain. I don't really know much about it, so my dad does. We'd always um, been um, impressed with how intelligent Russell really is. And um, he has incredible creativity, he has a strong vocabulary, he's very interested in the outside world, he can put concepts together, he's very logical, and he's, in fact, a very bright boy. Masculine. What's that one? Masculine. The ability to learn to read is a gift that not all children receive equally. Millions, like eight-year-old Russell Train, are dyslexic, unable to translate the squiggles on the page into sound and meaning. Say one more time. Sir, pick it. Let's move on to these. I know they're hard. When you were little and you started going to school and you started learning how to read, how, that, how was that going for you? Mm. Okay. Because they're mostly like, the words this big. And how about as you got older and started trying to learn read other things? What, what was that? Oh, it was getting a little harder for me because the words were getting bigger and the reading was getting a little more complicated and stuff. There is some family history of, uh, of this. Very bright people 
but trouble learning to read. I repeated third grade, my middle sister repeated kindergarten, and we were just told that we had to repeat and go to after school study hall. O A S D. You were just a slow learner. O S D P S D A. Dyslexia is the inability to learn to process written language despite adequate intelligence, adequate sensory, adequate exposure. You have adequate everything, and yet your system has been differently wired. What is happening in the brain of a dyslexic child that makes reading so difficult? At Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C., neuroscientist Guinevere Eden is scanning the brains of dyslexic children to see how they are different from children who read without problems. Russell, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is it loud enough? Yeah. Thank you. We're still trying to grapple already with what is the mechanism for dyslexia? How does the brain of a dyslexic differ? Brain imaging studies have shown that there are some areas that we see are active in individuals who are good readers during a reading task that we don't see in, in individuals who have dyslexia. Dit-ish. amp one part of Eden's study examines the brains of dyslexic children as they try to remove the first sound from words flashed on a screen. L. Scientists have demonstrated that the brains of some dyslexic children are not active in areas responsible for dissecting words into their constituent sounds. Children who have dyslexia really never understand the concept that one word may be made up of several sounds. For example, in the word cat, the sounds are k, uh, t, and we just blend them all together. And when we grow up speaking, we just say them as one sound, and that's all we need to do to convey the meaning. But now when we have to map that sound onto print, we have to understand that there are actually three sounds that make up the word cat. Duh, uh, oh. That fundamental ability to take the speech stream and get it into its tiny sound parts is pivotal in reading. Otherwise, the teacher's up there saying, B act, and the child has no idea what she's doing. I know you've used the tiles before, so I'm gonna show you some letters, and I want you to tell me the sound that these letters make. Good. Dyslexic children learn, but they learn differently. The Linda Mood Bell program offers several strategies to help them. Examine it really closely. Look at it really closely. It's like, um... The placement has the legs. Okay, so what we're going to do, Russell, is some color encoding or with the blocks. I'm going to give you a word, and you just put out the block for each sound that you feel. Mm -hmm. Okay? The first word is flip. Good job. So what word do we have all together again? Flip. Good job. If that's what we're prescribing for Russell's treatment is a procedure where we slow down the articulation of how we say words. He needs to be hypersensitized to the ability to take those sounds and pull them apart, but, but equally important to then put them back together, which is what we do when we read. Can you tell me the labels for the sounds? What your mouth is, what you feel your mouth doing? Oh, ip. Great. And when you make the p sound, is your tongue tapping or is your, are your lips popping? Um, popping. Right, so we call I that a... Lip popper. Yeah, lip popper. This sound here... We stimulate their ability to give conscious attention to what they feel when they produce a particular sound. Um, a smile sound? Yeah, why do we call it a smile sound? Because when you say it, it makes your own mouth smile. Very good. We know and we can see that you're getting behavioral changes. In other words, children, we can teach children to read better. What we don't understand are what are the, mechan what are the mechanisms in the brain that at a neurophysiological level change as a result of that process. After six weeks at Linda Mood Bell, Russell's reading has improved and Guinevere Eden wants to know how his brain has changed.
Based on previous studies with dyslexic adults who improved their reading skills, Eden speculates that Russell now uses more areas of his brain to read than normal readers, possibly even parts of his right hemisphere. The, the thing will be more meaningful when we have several children who've done the same thing. That gives us a, a much better view on you know, what's really going on, rather than just saying something about one child or two children. Right, right. It will be several years before Eden completes her study. But while she and other scientists wait to understand how, dyslexic children continue to remodel their own brains. Childhood can be one of the most wonderful periods of all of life because we have everything to discover. The child is father of the man, mother of the woman. I think the brain must be having a great time as a child because it's all plastic. If there's any one word for development and learning, it's plasticity. And plasticity, I believe, can be lifelong. The teenage brain, vulnerable to the dangers of drugs. I'm an addict, and I need, I need help. And the chaos of schizophrenia. I spent 19 years with the same personality, and all of a sudden it was taken away. in my mind as if my brain had split. I tried to match it seam by seam but could not make them fit. The thought behind I strove to join unto the thought before but sequence raveled out of sound like balls upon a floor. The teenage brain by the second decade of life, the human brain is full size. It's billions of neurons all in place. But it is not yet finished. The brain is a work in progress, and adolescence is the last great time of enormous brain change and brain development. Now the drama of brain development focuses on the part of the brain that makes us uniquely human, the still maturing prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain 
that allows us to make future plans and that's involved in such highly abstract areas as personal responsibility, morality, and self-control. This part of the brain is undergoing this major, major step in maturation during adolescence. With the part of the brain responsible for reason, judgment, and self-discipline still developing, it is no wonder that the teenage years can be a time of turmoil and confusion. The adolescent's brain is clumsy because all of a sudden there's these new parts of their brain that are online that are doing tasks and they're getting used to it. They are trying to figure out, okay, I've got a frontal cortex, what do I do with it? The developing teenage brain is in flux, shaping personality, behavior, even identity itself. As the brain matures, the teenager also faces special risks, from addictive drugs and alcohol that can hijack the brain to the chaos of schizophrenia that strikes most often during adolescence. Sometimes the teenage brain fails in ways that challenge even our most advanced understanding of how it works. Two years ago, Courtney Hale Cook was a senior in high school when he was struck by schizophrenia, a brain disease to which adolescents are particularly vulnerable. You know, I spent, up to that point, I had spent 19 years, you know, with virtually the same personality and I was very accustomed to it, and I liked it. I liked being me, you know? And all of a sudden, it was taken away. He would come up to me, and he would say, Mom, you look like a really old lady today. And he said, he would point to my eyes, and he'd say, you have a black hole here and a black hole there. Or he would describe things as going into tunnel vision so that everything else is black, except what was in that small tunnel at the end. When he would open his eyes in the morning, he would see gnats, he would see sparkles, not even with the first thought of the day, just the minute the eyes were open, he would have all these visual disturbances. But they're, they're usually in, in the very uh, center of my vision. Uh, uh, but it, it varies, uh, like, like now they're kind of just wherever I see the sky, uh, you know, they're, they're still there. I think it took him a number of weeks to come to me and say, you know, Mom, I've seen this in psych class, and Mom, I'm really, I'm really terrified, I'm really scared that I have schizophrenia. I felt like I was going crazy, and, uh, you know, I felt like I'm going to be crazy for the rest of my life. It's hard for me to imagine a disease that is crueler than schizophrenia. I mean, when does it begin? You know, in late adolescence and early 20s, just when a family and society have their maximal investment in a young person, just when, you know, they're about to graduate high school or college. And this child is lost in the most awful way. At the University of Iowa, Courtney is part of a research study that is investigating how schizophrenic brains function and malfunction. Schizophrenia is as complex as the brain itself, and clues to its biology have been stubbornly elusive. Schizophrenia is definitely an enigma. It's never been possible to identify an obvious disease-related feature that distinguishes schizophrenia from all other conditions. 
You look at a brain of a patient with schizophrenia under a microscope, you don't see anything that would make you say, aha, this is a disorder of these cells or those cells. What has gone wrong inside the brain of someone suffering from schizophrenia? For centuries, the answer has eluded researchers. But new imaging technologies have revealed how the brain fails to function properly. Focusing attention on several different brain regions that are underperforming. Regions responsible for thinking and reasoning, memory and emotion. The fact that so many regions are malfunctioning has led researchers to investigate a part of the brain which coordinates their operation, the prefrontal cortex. There's certainly a lot of evidence that the prefrontal cortex functions like the conductor in an orchestra and that it maintains harmony and it makes music out of many, many disparate elements of this orchestration. Uh, and that we think that part of the problem when the frontal cortex is deficient, as it may be in schizophrenia, is that instead of music, there's noise. One of the things that happened to me was that I was constantly like stupefied and uh, I do have a little bit of trouble uh, uh, staying coherent, uh, staying uh, to one particular subject, uh, you know, because my mind is somewhere else. This time I want you to tell me the color of the ink. Ignore what the word says and tell me the ink, red, blue, brown, okay? Right. As quickly as you can, ready, go. Red, blue, brown, red, green, blue, brown, brown. A uh, poorly functioning blue, prefrontal red, cortex blue, red, makes green, thinking difficult. Brown, blue, uh, it is no surprise that many people with schizophrenia don't perform well on a series of tests designed to measure their ability green, to think brown, and reason clearly. Red, blue. Courtney was once a good student, but as the disease progressed, his grades began to drop, and he finally had to put off plans for college. Schizophrenia is a disease that affects the highest human functions, the parts of us that are most evolutionarily advanced, our ability to think at high conceptual levels. Scientists had once hoped that MRI images of the brain would help solve the mysteries of schizophrenia by identifying damage to specific brain structures. Instead, the images revealed a new mystery. We were surprised to see that there was no obvious hole in the head. But what there was was that the ventricles of the brain, which are these centers in the brain that have spinal fluid, water in them, that are just cavities, were slightly bigger in patients with schizophrenia. Why were the ventricles, reservoirs of fluid that cushion the brain's delicate tissue, larger in schizophrenia? The oversized ventricles proved to be evidence that other areas of the brain were smaller. Your skull is made of hard bones that does not expand. So if the ventricles, these cavities got bigger, the only way all this could stay inside your skull was that something else had to get smaller. And there have been a lot of studies subsequently showing that there is a slight, very slight, thinning of the surface of the brain, the cortex, probably that accounts for these uh, changes in the ventricles. Once again, evidence pointed to a connection between damage in the prefrontal cortex and schizophrenia, which may help explain why the disease appears most often during adolescence. How can I trust you when I know what you've done? Baby, please believe that all that is done. If I decide to go along, I promise I won't do you wrong. Researchers are now looking more closely at developments in the normal adolescent brain for clues to what might trigger the onset of schizophrenia. The adolescent brain is far more flexible, far more adaptable than we had ever realized before. There's enormous potential for change, um, in, and not just change in sort of psychological dimensions, but actual physical, anatomical changes. At the beginning of adolescence, 
the prefrontal cortex goes through a burst of growth as neurons reach out to connect to other neurons, much as they do throughout the brain during early childhood. And just as in children, the connections between neurons in the teenage brain grow stronger, or they are pruned back and wither away. Sort of nature's way of making sure that the connections that do survive are hardy and, and robust. One of the ways the brain seems to try to figure out which connections to keep and which ones to eliminate or prune is based on the activities of the teen. The brain is searching for what am I going to need to be good at to survive in this environment? And the way that it figures that out is what am I doing now? Adolescence could be characterized as a stressful time for the brain. There are chemical changes, hormonal changes, anatomical changes, changes in the expression of genes inside of cells. It's a time of great biological tumult. And the frontal lobe is fighting to adapt to the environment, to deal with all these inner instinctual surges. It's difficult. It's difficult with a frontal lobe that's normal to make it through adolescence. But we believe that patients with schizophrenia don't have a frontal lobe that's normal. We believe it didn't develop normally, probably from early in life. Are there clues to schizophrenia in childhood that may explain the brain's later failure during adolescence? Can the child's brain be hiding within it the seeds of its own later malfunction? Psychologist Elaine Walker is trying to answer those questions by examining the home movies of children who later developed schizophrenia. We were looking for evidence that there was some abnormality in brain function. And of course, one of the best places to look for that in young children is in their motor development. This child only uses one hand to try to catch the ball. This child is showing some unusual posturing of his left hand, hyperextension of his fingers. Normal children develop crawling in a symmetric fashion. This is a very asymmetric crawling pattern, and that is another characteristic that we observed more often in the children who later developed schizophrenia. Walker's observations cannot be used to predict schizophrenia. Although these eccentric movements appear more frequently in children who eventually develop the disease, they can be found in normal children as well. But Walker's study is consistent with the theory that schizophrenia is caused by events in early brain development, even, perhaps, just months after conception. As neurons are born, take their place in the developing brain, and then join one another in an intricate network of connections, scientists see the possibility for error. The genetic makeup of the brain itself, poor nutrition during pregnancy, or a viral infection, all may have devastating effects. Whatever the cause, scientists speculate the damage lies dormant until adolescence, when the prefrontal cortex goes through its final maturation. Schizophrenia could be a disease in which this last developmental stage is run amok and we end up literally with the wrong connections in the brain. Courtney, we're going to bring a monitor over in front of you that you'll be viewing throughout the study. Okay. Schizophrenia disrupts not only the thinking parts of the brain, but it can also have a severe impact on the emotions. Courtney, next you'll be viewing some slides that most people find to be pleasant or positive in content. Just relax and watch. To probe the, the emotional regions and of the brain, researchers flash a series of pictures on a screen and use advanced imaging technologies to watch the brain's response. The normal brain responds to these stimulating images by activating regions of the brain that process emotions. 
these same regions respond poorly in many people with schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia will very often say, I've lost the capacity to feel related to other people in the world, or even related to the world at all. It's both a, an intellectual emptiness and an emotional emptiness. And it's one of the factors that drives people with schizophrenia to feel like taking their lives, to feel like committing suicide, because they, they feel as if they've lost themselves. The thing that really crushed me was the lack of motivation, uh, the, the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, uh, the flat affect, the, uh, the emotionlessness, the apathy. Uh, those were the things that really got to me. He would talk frequently about not being able to feel anything. He could feel no sorrow. He could feel no joy. There was just nothing there. No sorrow. Just empty. That's what he would describe. Just empty and black. I, uh didn't want to live the life that I'd been given anymore. It was so contrary to what I wanted uh, that I didn't want it anymore. When I heard that Courtney had attempted suicide, I, I was not surprised. He had talked about it, he has had ideas about suicide, and he's one of those individuals that understands he has an illness and it's not likely to go away. That he hadn't succeeded was perhaps what surprised me the most, because he succeeds in most things that, that he's done in life up to the schizophrenia. I wrote in my suicide note that uh, why take death seriously if the quality of life is poor? And. Uh, that thought really stuck with me for a long time. While schizophrenia has stolen Courtney's emotional life, other teenagers with schizophrenia suffer from hallucinations as well. Frightening visions and voices that do not exist. June 17, 2000. Dear Diary, it's been strange. It wasn't a good day. I'm so depressed, I hate myself. Things would be better if, well, you know, gotta go now. Love, Sabrina Yeskel. Sabrina Yeskel was an excited 12-year-old when she first went off to sleepaway camp. Once there, she began to hear voices. They were loud. The tone of voice was a deep, heavy-set voice. They said to kill yourself. They said, I'm not worth living. Sabrina's mother rushed to camp, but barely recognized her daughter. She started screaming, stop. And I said, what, Sabrina? What's, what's going on? She said, he's trying to kill me. So I pulled off the road, tried to hold her and tell her everything was OK. We made it home, but she came in the house screaming. They were, the man was following her everywhere and he was still trying to, he was trying to choke her. Sabrina was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Now 14, she has been struggling for two years to stay in touch with reality. She still hears threatening voices and hallucinations haunt her waking hours. Sabrina often sees a, a black hooded dressed figure um, that sometimes will just stare at her, sometimes it talks to her, sometimes it tries to touch her, sometimes it tries to kill her. Sometimes when she's struggling with this, they begin almost chanting, kill yourself, do it, do it, do it. At the University of North Carolina, 
Researchers are investigating how hallucinations can overwhelm the adolescent brain, and they are testing new drugs to help treat these psychotic symptoms. Could you look right at that keyhole over there? I'm going to check your eyes out if that's okay. Isaac Wallace there. began to hear voices when he first went off to college. As the voices grew more frightening and his thoughts more paranoid, he was finally hospitalized for his own protection. When Isaac walked in the hospital, he was completely wrapped up in um, hallucinatory experiences he was having, the voices he was hearing, the beliefs he ha had developed to explain the voices. Whenever I'd hear voices, I'd just completely like black out what was in the real world uh -huh. and just think about like what the voices were saying and like talk to them. The voices that Isaac heard were disturbing because they appeared so real, yet they were produced by his own flawed brain. When you see psychosis, you realize that we don't hear with our ears. We hear with our brain. We don't see with our eyes. We see with our brain. And so when the brain misfires, you can have experiences of hearing voices that sound just like they're coming from outside your head. In the normal brain, waves of sound falling on the ear travel as electrical and chemical pulses to the hearing part of the brain, the auditory cortex, generating a surge of signals that travel to the thinking regions of the brain where they are interpreted. Scientists believe that in psychosis, the thinking regions fail. Neurons misfire in random and chaotic ways, creating sounds that have no connection to the outside world. The result? A perception of sounds that do not exist. So when the brain misfires, when the circuitry in your brain is out of whack, it will be just as if you're hearing um, the radio on. Scientists theorize that psychosis is caused in part by problems with a chemical in the brain called dopamine, one of the brain's neurotransmitters, molecules that send messages from cell to cell across a tiny gap, the synapse. In the normal brain, dopamine acts by stimulating receptors on the neuron that is its target, setting off a cascade of electrical and chemical reactions. In the psychotic brain, for reasons that scientists are still trying to understand, the levels of dopamine surge, overstimulating the receptors, wrecking havoc with the brain's ability to send clear and accurate signals. Since the 1950s, antipsychotic medications have been standard treatment for relieving psychosis. For Isaac, they have worked wonders. I'd say within three weeks, the voices really, like, they drop maybe in half to maybe 75% less than what I was hearing. Yeah, it has brought me out of, like, my own little world and, you know, brought me back into reality. I can hold a job now and I think I can go back to school as well because my memory's back and my concentration is back. I think I might do better than I did before. <laughs> Antipsychotic medications relieve psychosis by reducing the impact of dopamine on the neuron by clogging dopamine sensitive receptors. With diminished neuronal stimulation, psychotic symptoms lessen and often disappear. You know, we were lucky. We found the right medicine for Isaac. And at this point, I think he's had a almost complete recovery. He's back to his old self, his old Isaac. Antipsychotic medications don't cure schizophrenia, and Isaac will need to take them for the rest of his life. But in some people, the drugs don't work at all. Schizophrenia varies from person to person, and Sabrina has a more resistant form of the disease. When Sabrina first became seriously sick two years ago, it seemed like we had a hundred possible medicines to try and certainly one of them would work. And yet, we discover that they haven't worked, and it's getting very scary, because we don't have many left. And as a parent, it's incredibly difficult to watch your child suffer. But it's also, I, I see her courage, I really do. I see her fighting this every day, and I'm incredibly proud of her. Oh, I'll, I'll remember it later. 
later. That, that's who taught me. It was my dad, and it was... For Courtney, and, uh, medications have helped him pull back from the emotional void he once faced. His thoughts of suicide have passed. He still struggles with his illness, but he is going on with his life and has recently entered college. I'd rather have lived the life that I live right now, as confusing and painful as, as it has been, than to have never been born at all. I think he has learned a lot about how fragile life is. I think he has learned a lot about what is really important. Every year, 300,000 Americans are diagnosed with schizophrenia. Most of them first develop symptoms in their late teens. But millions more teenagers are vulnerable to another danger. Adolescence is a time of growing independence. As the prefrontal cortex matures, teenagers are beginning to explore the world on their own. But their judgment and reasoning are still not fully developed, which makes it especially risky when they experiment with addictive drugs and alcohol. Twelve and a half million American teenagers suffer from serious drug abuse problems or addiction. Adolescence is a time when kids are exposed to all kinds of influences in the world, some of them terribly negative, like drugs of abuse. Addiction is a disease of the brain that affects thinking, emotion, and behavior. In that sense, it's like many other serious brain diseases, like depression, like schizophrenia. Only here, the pathogen are the drugs of abuse themselves, acting on a vulnerable brain. I never thought that I would become an addict or even thought about being an addict until I really started doing coke. And then it kind of dawned on me, I'm doing cocaine now. It's not just weed. It's not just alcohol, you know. This, this is getting worse and worse. Jessie Galatar began experimenting with alcohol when she was 11. Marijuana followed shortly after, and then an array of other addictive drugs. By 16, she was addicted to cocaine. She had to have it to function. She had to have it to get out of bed. She couldn't get out of bed without doing cocaine first. She couldn't walk into the school without having done cocaine in the parking lot. And it wasn't fun anymore. It was just, she had to do it to live. I was just like, I've got to do something right now or I'm gonna die. Because I couldn't live like that anymore. By 17, caught in a desperate obsession, Jesse checked into the Karen Foundation in eastern Pennsylvania, a residential drug rehab center. Who else in here uses pot a lot? Here, teenage addicts try to regain control over their lives that have been captured by addiction. After a while, it was like, instead of me having the control over the drugs, it was like the drugs had control over me. If I was sick, I was thinking about dope. If I was on dope, I was thinking about how I'm going to get it again. And, like, that's all I thought about all the time. One day I was sober. I didn't have anything to drink and nothing to smoke. And I realized it was the first day in a long time that I had no chemicals in my body. And it felt weird and I was irritated. And I was, it was the worst day of my life. You know, I've been here about a week now. I'm still not recovered. I still, every single day, want to smoke. And it's been a part of my life for so long. You know, Addiction I mean, used to be viewed as simply a moral failing, a weakness of character. I just love it so much. But scientists have begun to investigate how addictive substances fundamentally change the brain, gradually taking control over motivation and desire. Addiction research has focused on the neural circuitry in the brain's reward pathway the network of neurons where our desires arise. Flowing along this network, continuously stimulating our pleasures and appetites, are the neurotransmitters that one neuron uses to talk to another. 
Addictive drugs work by altering the level of these neurotransmitters and slyly capturing the reward pathway. All addictive drugs are Trojan horses. Every single one of the chemicals that are addictive are mimics. That is, they look like a neurotransmitter. They look like one of the chemicals that the brain uses for nerve cells to communicate with one another. Many addictive drugs mimic one of the most powerful neurotransmitters in the reward pathway, dopamine. In the normal brain, dopamine travels across the synapse, stimulates receptors on the target neuron, and then it is quickly reabsorbed by tiny molecular vacuum cleaners called dopamine transporters. But when cocaine is abused, trillions of cocaine molecules surge into the synapses, clogging the vacuum cleaners artificially boosting the level of dopamine in the brain, producing a cocaine high. Let's imagine a wonderful natural reward. You know, I go to a restaurant and have the best ice cream sundae I've ever had. You know, I'd have a certain amount of dopamine probably being released in my brain. But cocaine, which gets there chemically, gives your brain, gives these synapses more dopamine for a longer amount of time than it has ever experienced before. Now with the experience of your first drug high, particularly when it's cocaine and heroin, watch what happens. The dopamine levels ascend above and beyond those experienced with orgasm. Above and beyond the greatest physiologic experience we can have as men and women. I got so high, and I literally thought I was floating. I was just, you know, da da da, you know, going through, you know, you know, bumping into people and ha making jokes and laughing, and tears were rolling down my face. I was laughing so hard. And after doing like three or four, I just kind of sit back and light a cigarette, and it would just like fill me, like completely, and like it was like taking me away from the world. Once the drugs and the alcohol are introduced into the addicted brain, the natural system is what we call down-regulated. It means that the things that are supposed to work for exercise and food and all the things that are supposed to make us feel good, they basically go into hibernation. You have a feeling of hopelessness such that the only thing you can possibly do to have any semblance of pleasure in your life is to re-administer the drug. The first high can be exhilarating, but after repeated drug abuse, the dark side to addiction begins to take its toll. The brain responds to the repeated use of cocaine and the dopamine surging in the synapse by fighting back, cutting away receptors on the neuron that are the dopamine's target. Without the receptors, dopamine can't stimulate the neuron, and the drug high is reduced. But so is enjoyment of all normal pleasures as well. It tricks my brain, you know? Uh, it made me think that, you know, that I was happy, that I enjoyed my life, when in fact I really didn't. When I wasn't high, I hated my life. I remember writing diary entries, like, I was in pain, but I still want to do more, and I can't stop. And I just wanted to die all the time. I didn't even want to live anymore. You know, none of these kids sat down and said, hey, I want to be a drug addict. Actually, what happened is, uh, like lots of other adolescents, they played what turned out for them to be a game of Russian roulette. There was something about their genes, something about their temperament, that made them vulnerable, so that when other kids got away, often scot-free, they got hooked. There was something different about their brains. We've got some alcohol in here, and our job now is to help you to consume this beverage in about a 10-minute period. Like so, cocaine, uh, Alcohol is dangerously addictive. By their senior year in high school, nine and a half million American teenagers will have tried it. So, you've been watching the sports? At the San Diego Veterans Hospital, 
Mark Shuckett is trying to understand what makes some of these teenagers more vulnerable to alcohol than others. Oh, yeah, sure. Super. That's great. For volunteers like 18-year-old Justin and 21-year-old Elika, Shuckett collapses one night of drinking into 10 minutes and then records the way their brains respond. Alcohol has a huge impact on brain waves, and it is indeed one of the ways that one can measure how the brain is changing in the presence of alcohol or other drugs. We gave them equivalent amounts of alcohol per kilogram. The result of that was that their blood alcohol levels were virtually identical. What the brain waves show us is that Elika is responding more to the alcohol than Justin. Her brain waves are being impacted by the alcohol significantly more than Justin's brain waves are being affected. So on a 0 to 36 scale, how high do you feel? 36. What do you think about the slurredness of your speech? Are you, is your speech slurred? Mm, I don't think so, but it prob probably is. It's probably like a 20. Okay. And regarding how drunk or intoxicated you feel overall? 36. And she was stuff. having difficulty mm -hmm. concentrating, was having problems focusing on exactly what it was that we were talking about. And she had some pretty darn good insight that she was feeling pretty high. And on a 0 to 36 scale, how high, using that term generically, feeling in, high or intoxicated are you? Nothing. I don't feel anything really, like okay. maybe a one. And how about how clumsy you feel you might be? Nah, zero. And um, problems where you feel like you're floating? <laughs> zero. Got it. Justin had the same blood alcohol level, and when we asked him how he felt, he was basically saying, I don't feel much. It was almost close to zero, very low on the scale. And all you had to do was look at him, and you knew that he was feeling less. Zero. The same blood alcohol level, very different reactions. Zero. The two people are starting out their drinking evenings with basically different equipment on board. Elika, after one or two drinks, is likely to look around and say, I'm getting pretty high, I'd better slow down. And a zero to Justin, we would guess, when he goes to a party, zero. just having a couple of drinks, he probably looks around and says, well, what's the big deal? And he's probably more likely to go on to three, four, or five. Yeah, zero on that. Justin gets deal? drunk. It just takes Justin a lot more alcohol to get drunk than Elika. Even though Justin's brain responds more slowly to alcohol, he is more likely than Elika to become an alcoholic. Because he is less aware of alcohol's powerful effect, he may keep drinking when Elika might stop, exposing his brain to ever higher levels of alcohol and increasing the chance that he will become addicted. You know, I've talked to kids my age, my size, six beers and they're passed out. For me, six beers, I'm just starting to get warmed up. I can drink easily almost a case of beer to myself. You know, I have alcoholism in the family, you know, going back generations, and I'm sure that plays a major role. But it seemed like... One of the major reasons why alcohol dependence is running in families is because people inherit genes that impact on how their brains function. We found that a low response to alcohol is associated with a high risk for alcoholism regardless of your family history. But if you have both, a family history of alcoholism and a low response to alcohol, your risk is really quite large. Either three out of four or all four of my grandparents were alcoholics, which increases the probability of being an alcoholic. And like, it was just pretty much people who looked at me, even when, from when I was little, could would tell me, you know, you're going to be an alcoholic when you start drinking. But once teenagers become hooked by alcohol and drugs, why can't they stop? How do drugs change the brain to make recovery so difficult for many and impossible for others? Edward Coleman began using marijuana when he was 13 and quickly advanced to abusing other drugs. By 19, he was a hardened cocaine addict, living on the edge, 
hustling and scamming to feed his all-consuming habit. I can remember days can't go to sleep from thinking about trying to get high. What can I do or where can I go or who can I rob to get money just to get high? So we just have to get your position in the right way so that we can comfortably get up on the table here. Dr. Anna Rose Childress has been studying drug addiction for over two decades. We're going to see some videos, and they could be nature videos or scary or sexy or drug-related. Researchers have long observed that recovering addicts relapse most often when they return to their drug-using neighborhoods and friends. Childress wondered if it was these cues that somehow triggered an insatiable need for drugs in a brain changed by addiction. Just the reminder of drug use, just seeing these friends, seeing a crack pipe, smelling the smell, creates this overwhelming sense of need, of craving, that the world is completely out of balance till I have some cocaine. Childress devised a simple experiment. She scanned the brains of long-term cocaine addicts, but only after they'd been drug-free for two weeks. This would ensure that the images she captured were not cocaine's high, but more permanent changes to the brain. She showed her subjects a series of video images. First, nature scenes. Then, images of explicit drug use. The two different videos produced very different activity in the addicts' brains. The scans during the nature video revealed very little brain activity. But when the videotape switched to drug use, the scans erupted in red, indicating intense brain activity. We could see that the brain was doing something special and something different when a person was in state of desire than when they weren't. It was extremely exciting for us because it was the first time really in all of human history that we'd been able to peek inside the brain during desire. And these are images that were done in the PET scanner that showed... Childress had captured an image of how the brain had been fundamentally altered to produce a driving hunger for cocaine. Well, our patients describe craving as the thing that can push them to do things that they never imagined that they would do, to cross their own rules, their own values, to put their, not only their relationships in jeopardy, or their possessions, or their jobs, but their very lives. It's like being a victim of a vicious pit bull attack. Once the dog attacks you and locks onto you, he's not letting go. The only way to get him off is to kill him. And that's pretty much how I was looking at it. The only way to get out of drug addiction was to die. Despite the craving carved into his brain, Coleman was able to beat his addiction. And he did it in a way that has intrigued researchers. Coleman's legs were a casualty of a stray bullet in his drug-filled neighborhood. But this tragedy allowed him to make a surprising discovery. He was still using cocaine, but to calm his paralyzed but trembling legs, he began taking the common muscle relaxant, baclofen. When he ran out of cocaine, he was surprised to find he no longer needed it. As long as I was taking the baclofen, it was blocking my mind from thinking that I needed the drugs. It was blocking that part of me that thought about it and wanted it. The baclofen appeared to be overriding the craving for cocaine etched into his brain. When Coleman reported his observations to Childress, she was intrigued by this homegrown scientific experiment. So we offered him a PET scan in our usual hummingbird video, cocaine video, with the bet that on baclofen that we wouldn't see the hot spots lighting up in these areas that are important for anticipating reward. Sure enough, 
look, there are no hot spots. So for you watching the nature video, your brain didn't respond very much differently when you're watching the cocaine video. His two scans are identical. So the way that he looks at the nature video, the way he looks during the cocaine video, there are no hot spots. So it's really encouraging to us that his description of how he feels, that he doesn't feel pulled and that he feels as though everything's in a manageable range, really matches up with his brain. His brain agrees. Baclofen may prove to be the first medication to actually curb the insatiable desire for cocaine. And it is now in early testing on addicts. But until medications are available to fight addiction, addicts will continue to struggle to overcome addiction on their own. Jesse and these other teenagers will spend anywhere from between three weeks to three months reclaiming their lives. And they have learned important lessons about how drugs have changed their brains. I'm sitting here and I'm really dwelling on the fact that I'm an addict and I need, I need help and I'm not going to be able to do this by myself and I need to do all the things that they teach me and, um, and it's really hard. It's really hard. It's scary. The disheartening reality is that eight out of ten addicts who leave rehab relapse and return to their addiction, sometimes after months and even years of sobriety. I'm still terrified of, like, relapse and just starting to use again. Um, and that's actually, it's kind of good, because I'm less likely to come back out if I am scared to death of it. You don't want it too tight. You just want it so the helmet's not moving around on you. The last hurdle many of these teenagers will face before leaving rehab will be an aerial ropes course. As you notice, there's two cables, one on each side, that suspend the ladder, the rungs, okay? You can't hold on to those. Okay. The only thing you can hold on to are those rungs <laughs> and your partner. <laughs> This is not as easy as it looks. Harnesses and that this graduation exercise symbolizes the challenge these teenagers face in beating their addictions after their brains have been distorted by drugs. Nice. Pull, 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 pull. You got it, ladies. Nice job. Nice job. A critical part of the brain has literally been hijacked by drugs of abuse. It's been rewired so that behavior is now focused on this life of obtaining and using drugs. Communication is a key. The behavior has become automatic, and the trick for the person who's recovering is to stop these automatic responses. Look above you. What's above you? There you go. What we attempt to do here is recruit other parts of your brain to diminish those improper messages. <laughs> Knowing we can't eradicate them, we attempt to recruit other soldiers, all right, other parts of the brain to help diminish those feelings. If I had to guess, what we have to shore up is the prefrontal cortex, the critical functions of this prefrontal cortex, what we call executive function, self-control, the ability to literally have responsibility for oneself. And we can do that because their whole brain has not been overthrown by drugs of abuse. Okay, I don't want to do it. Liz, all you've got to do is reach up, okay? Grab on to, to uh, Chrissy. Don't pull yet. I've got you here on the rope, too. <laughs> my greatest fear which is climbing and I work through my greatest fear I could do anything I could do anything adolescence is one of probably the most demanding times in life you're learning how to function as a human in society 
You're beginning to try and form partnerships and long-lasting friendships. You're becoming sexually aware. And we know that leaving home, becoming an adult, having a family requires a number of much more complicated mental, psychological abilities. And the organ of all of these changes in the way people think and emote and make judgments is, after all, their brain. And we've another episode of The Secret Life of the Brain at the same time tomorrow. <laughs>